Manager of Weekly Winery Chat. This is already episode four. You know, it's hard to believe that we've done this four times already. In fact, the only thing that's different is my hair keeps looking worse and worse. Never mind the restaurant. I just wish it opened the damn barber shop. Anyway, as uh, most of you know, um, we do this uh, every week. It's uh, done here, and it's always live from New Jersey. So, as those of you know our format, I spend uh, three or four minutes talking about a book that I think you should read. It's usually uh, pertinent to our, our topic, and it gives people a few minutes to get on and uh, be online and ready before we start the, the formal talk. So I then pontificate for about 15 minutes or so. Today's topic is really experimental winemaking. And then it's open for questions. And you can send questions via text uh, on that phone number on the screen there. Or if you're logged into YouTube, you can do live chat. So our book today is this one. It's called The Science, Wine Science, and it's by Jamie Good. And this book is very interesting because it has a lot of detail about winemaking that is not like your typical home winemaking book. You know, match the grapes, measure pH, and toss it in, and measure your bricks, and so on and so forth. It's really more about specific topics. So half the book is about the vineyard, and we don't really need to worry about that. But the second section is called the winery. And here, the topics are oxygen management, uh, selection of yeast, sulfate management, um, alcohol, dealkalization. So these are relatively advanced topics, but I think that if you're going to do experiments with wine, you really need to understand the basic science, okay? You cannot do things, you understand what pH, what things are soluble, when the polyphenols are actually uh, expressed, and so forth. So this is really highly recommended. Wine science, Jamie Good. And by the way, I don't get anything for these plugs. Uh, but I just feel that I spent a lot of time developing my wine library and I think that I can help you and get some background. So, with that said, we are going to go to our topic for the day. So, again, this is about experimental winemaking. It's episode 4 and it's April 29th and we're going to start now. So, first of all, why experiment with wine? Many people have this idea that it's a traditional product. It should be done the way it was always done, the old-fashioned, handmade craftsmanship and all that. But they fail to realize that wine in the past is pretty shitty. If you, you would not drink Roman wine today, the alcohol content was so low that it would spoil. So they put in resin, cinnamon, whatever the hell they could do, keep it from spoiling, and they give it some kind of a reasonable taste, at least drinkable. So it's actually nonsense to think that nothing evolves with time and nothing improves with experimentation. Think about yourself. Uh, 20 years ago, you'd go to a diner and they'd give you a uh, meatloaf or baked ziti and you'd eat it. That's all you had. But now, this, you can't sell this food. People have become more sophisticated. Maybe it's all the TV shows they watch, but they're more sophisticated. So same with wine. We have to learn how to make better wine. And the only way is experimentation. So again, going back to my theme about tradition and experimentation, this is obviously art. This is a landscape by Rembrandt, and it's art. Is this art? This is almost the same scene by Picasso. Of course it's art, and it's got its own facets, its evolution from what was a, a simple pictorial depiction to something that is more conceptual. And he can bring out things that you don't actually see in real life. So, the go fermenter makes wine experiments easy, and that's why I think it's very useful tool. There's no cleaning. You can fill it very quickly from a distemmer, just pumping it in. It's automated. The punch down is automated. The temperature control is perfect. It's an effortless punch. So these things make it possible to make consistent experiments. You cannot make a meaningful experiment unless you control all the variables that you need to stay constant. If you want to study the effect of yeast, everything else must be the same. Same grapes, same yeast, same temperature, same punch down schedule. With the government, that's easy. And last but not least, we have no insects. So our setup, and it changes. Our setup today 
is actually six fermenters. It's three uh, juniors with about 100 pounds each. And then we have three of the neck machines, which are running at half capacity. These are 1,000 pounds, half a ton. And this is a good quantity to really do an experiment without committing too much uh, of your grape resource. A popular setup that we sell mostly to universities is the four go fermenter pack. And it's really useful because you can study one control, let's say three different temperatures, three different yeasts, and it's very simple to operate. Some of our clients, University of New Mexico, Penn State University, Grayson College in Texas, and the Centre du Rosé in southern France. Centre du Rosé is very interesting because they purchased these units to look at how they can cope with climate change. The grapes are changing and they want their Cote de Rhone to taste the same. So they're using these machines to experiment with fermentation conditions. So some of the studies we've done in Junior, uh, we obviously have tested various yeast strains. So we take a varietal like Cabernet Sauvignon, Foch, or Riesling, and we try it with three or four different yeasts simultaneously, same time, same grape, same conditions, and taste and measure the differences. We look at the effect of punch down conditions. You know, for example, with a Pinot Noir, with a thin skin grape, is it useful to have a very light punch down, say low pressure twice a day? With the Petit Syrah, is the correct strategy eight punches a day, high pressure, to extract as much of the uh, tannic material? This is a study that we've done. Effect of temperature, being a fermentation at four different temperatures, see what happens. The effects of nutrients and nutrient timing. Do you add all your nutrients up front? Do you add it later on? Do you add it some sort of sequencing? The Junior is perfect for this. 100 pounds, easy to use. See, the beauty of Junior really is that pressing is easy. In red wine, small-scale presses are a pain in the ass. So here, all you have to do is push a button, the bladder's in plate, you squirt the wine out, and you collect it. You do your analysis, uh, measurements, tasting, whatever you want, the pumice is in the bag, take it out, put it in your compost pile, put a new bag in, and you're good to go. So some of the crazy things we've done in Junior, um, we've done something called continuous badinage. We're actually using the punch-down mechanism to in white wine. Now obviously punch-down is not common in white wine because there is no cap to manage. But our idea is that to do this to keep the leaves in suspension. So we've done it for Sauvignon Blanc and Riesling, and in fact I want to talk about the Riesling. Um, I actually have samples of the two Rieslings that were made by this technique, right? And you can see the colors are pretty much identical. The fermentation performance is quite similar. The alcohol level is 12.5%, nothing very different. The fructose, glucose, zero, pH is normal, total acid, malic acid, so forth, right? But when you look at the sensory experience, it's completely different. They, they're both having oxidation, the nose is clean, but in the one that was butternage, now remember with butternage, it actually was cloudy during the fermentation because the leaves were stirred up. But the end result, in the beginning, it, they tasted a little different. Actually, it was like carb, a bit of a carbonized, it's like a carb, you know, uh, fuzzy, fuzzy feeling with the one that was uh, butternage. But then it settled down, it has a much better body more rounded and quite interesting. So with this, we actually have started to do a large scale, a thousand pound test in the neck machine to see how this continuous butternage works in larger scale. Okay, we also have experiments trying to press juice in Junior to make white wine. With these stem grapes, it's quite easy to do. You get good yields, no problems. We tried whole cluster and this was a complete disaster. Okay, most of the berries were never broken open. It appears that the gentle press, which is so great for pressing the wine, is really terrible at breaking berries. So whole cluster is something that we cannot recommend doing in junior. We've also tried dextrose feed during fermentation, and then us and other people have done a lot of fruit wines now. Peach, cider using whole apples, berries, quite interesting things to try out. In the net, at the large scale, We've, we're now doing continuous butternage with your fermentation. I'll talk about that in more detail in a bit. We again try to press juice in net. And again, with these stem white grapes, good yield, you get your 150, 160 gallons per ton, but whole cluster is a disaster. There is not enough pressure to break the berries. We also have been experimenting with temperature shifts. The idea here is that you can do a white wine, you want to do it at say 59 Fahrenheit, but 
it, it seems to be a better strategy to start, say, at 65. Get the yeast population up, get it growing, maybe a day or two into it, drop the temperature to 59, and see how that turns out in your wine. We also do uh, fruit wines in, in net. And cider is interesting because we do it whole apple. We take whole apples, uh, basically cut them up, throw them in, and do a punch, like a red wine, and then press it out at the end. We're actually running this week. You know, I know this is not winemaking season in the Northern Hemisphere, but uh, we have experiments to run. And so we have uh, Cabernet Sauvignon for South Africa, fresh grapes uh, in pick baskets. And we have Sauvignon Blanc in pick baskets from Chile. So we have three juniors running, 100 pounds each. The Cabernet Sauvignon test is to try some new yeast strains in preparation for the uh, fall runs. One Sauvignon Blanc is material that was pressed from whole cluster. Even though the yield was poor, we are curious to see if there are different aromatics in this case, because these are pressed right from grape without any air contact. So let's see how this uh, comes out. And then the other uh, junior is Sauvignon Blanc with pressed juice. So it's a control for the, for the middle one. The three neck machines, one is running Cabernet Sauvignon, and it's really just a video run. We want to reshoot some of the uh, setup videos, so we need to do that run again. One Sauvignon Blanc is very interesting. It's actually being fermented on skin. So we basically are just using crushed grapes, like a red wine, and we have it running on punch down. And we want to see if we're going to get a better extraction of phenols out of this without getting too much harshness. So we're going to run it to 6% ethanol and then press it. The last one is a control. It's basically Sauvignon Blanc, pressed juice, but running with button notch once a day it's punched. So I'm going to actually do something interesting today. We have a new app where you can look at your, uh, your fermenter over the cloud from anywhere in the world. And here's the app. Our next uh, weekly chat, we'll talk about the app in great detail. But here I'm going to go to the Cab Sauvignon, which is over there in the winery. And I'm going to ask it to punch. And we're going to go to the live webcam and see what happens. There's the middle one. And look at that. It's starting to be pushed up as the bag in the back inflates. Uh, the units are either side of the two uh, Sauvignon Blancs, one with the skins and one with the pressed juice. I'm going to actually cancel the punch now, so it should come back down in a few seconds. And that's about it. So that's live from the winery. And this new app, you can actually do this from anywhere in the world. It's totally cloud-based, and uh, it's also available to all our previous uh, uh, users. There's an uh, upgrade can be done right on the internet, and it's free. So, we look at some more um, examples. Uh, we've done some work of frozen versus fresh must, and basically we took the grapes, we separated some of them and froze them down. We looked at Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and Foch. Uh, and we looked basically at all the fermentation profiles between the frozen must fermentation and the fresh grape fermentation. So we did all the fermentation rates. We have our uh, very useful and absurdly expensive Enofos analyzer, where you give it one drop of wine, it gives you all the uh, parameters, ethanol, glucose, fructose, uh, lactic acid, pH, and everything. So it provides you with a very good assessment of the fermentation rate. And between the frozen and the fresh, there's really not much of a difference. Uh, it appears that there's a little more tannic extraction and color from the frozen. So if anything, the frozen is actually better than the fresh grapes. The, Sensory evaluation is probably the most important, and you can see our little counter there, glasses and glasses of uh, wine to drink and test. Uh, and so we use the sensory aid to, to make the final judgment. It turns out that frozen works really well, but it's not very cost effective for commercial wineries. It's fine for home use and experimental use, uh, but I think unless there's some change in the process, it's difficult. Also, it's difficult to thaw a large quantity of frozen grapes. It takes a very long time. And you have to be careful that the liquid doesn't separate and so forth. For that, you know, with Junior, the punch is really handy because you can put the thawing material into it and just run the punch system all day long and it will kind of blend all the frozen uh, must back together again. We've also done a number of temperature studies to show temperature uniformity in the go fermenter. This is covered in great depth in episode one. Now, all our episodes are actually on the website, and so you can go back and look at an old episode and, and see if you, there's now something of interest to you. So, 
So this slide, we put temperature probes down the depth of the gold fermenter and we measure temperatures every um, 10 centimeters. And you can see that, I won't go into more detail here, it's on episode one, but you can see that there's a variation in temperature before the punch. The cap is much hotter than the bottom, and this is a common situation in a macro bin or a tank. The cap can be 10, 15 degrees hotter than the juice at the bottom. But with the punch, we're actually squashing the must, pushing it up, dispersing the cap, and within about 17 hours, which is about eight punches later, there is no temperature variation. The cap is the same temperature as the bottom, and we believe that this feature of the gold fermenter is unique. There's not many fermenters, if any, that can actually blend into a fermenting musk, and this is what gives it such a, a smooth and consistent wine. We don't get reductive aromas because we have no areas where it's actually too hot. Pressing, again, oh, one thing I should say. You know, some of the experiments we do are related to winemaking, to make a better wine or to develop conditions for better winemaking, but a lot of our work is actually the development of process and improvements to our equipment and process. So pressing is an example where we spend a lot of time to improve how we press the grapes. In the original setup, you can see the grapes are fermenting on that one side of the chamber. We would require it to be pumped out the bottom outlet. So there was a pump, a must pump, because it has to pump grapes, expensive must pump, because it has to handle a fair amount of solids. And these, this, this must be put on top of a pump over sump. This is typically a kind of a, a sieve. So the pump is retained on top of the sieve, the wine goes through, and you have to have a second pump that pumps the wine out to your collection chamber. And then, of course, the pump is, some of it piles up on the pump over sump, if you manually collect it and discard it. So this caused several difficulties. First of all, we had clogging issues because a two-inch port on the bottom sometimes clogs up with must. Uh, you can't get it too dry in that bag because then you can't pump it out. And finally, you had an open operation. It was being oxidized on the pump over sump. And finally, you had to handle the pumice. So we decided to, for some years ago to try many different techniques and the current system is quite different. Here again, it looks the same, but instead of doing it outside the bag, we do the whole operation inside the bag. We put a press tube, which is basically a stainless strainer tube, inside the bag, and then we pump it out with a simple, inexpensive, flexible impeller wine pump. So you only need one pump, because it's only pumping wine, all the solids are held in the bag by the strainer tube. So you collect the wine with the system, the Pumice is basically collected in the bag and then the inflation bag presses it and pushes out any residual wine. So you can see on the top, the pumice is actually very dry in the system. It's also contained in the bag, so all you have to do is lift the liner out and it's already packaged for disposal to landfill or wherever it's going. Now, there are many subtle issues here. We had to invent something we call a pivot strap, and you get this with your go for metric kit. It's used to secure the inflation bag so it doesn't come forward. So normally when you're, when you're punching, this strap will remain sort of slack. But when you're pressing, it starts, the bag starts to move forward. And if it goes too far forward, it interferes with the strainer tube. So this pivot strap basically prevents it from going past vertical. And you'll see it actually looking vertical when you're almost done with the pressing. And by the way, we are actually updating all our videos and manuals to provide more of the uh, more uh, guidance on things that people feel are hard to understand or hard to visualize. So you're going to see a whole new set of videos helping you set up and see how it all operates. So, lastly, thanks for watching. I am available for the next 10, 15 minutes if uh, you have any uh, questions. Uh, or any comments or anything I like to do, I'm going to go on my cell phone here and see if I have any questions. Sometimes there's a delay, so I will show you some other right things as, as we're waiting. Um, this, this is the cooling system for Junior. You know, in NET, we have a plate on the bottom and we circulate the cooling fluid through the plate. In 
June here, there's not enough surface area for a plate. So we take the tube that is June here, which as you can remember, has the perforated section, and then it has uh, this, the, the part where you take a sample. So what we do is we have a cooling coil that's wrapped around it. And in fact, it's quite unique. There's only one company I could find in the United States that can actually make a bend like this. Take it out here, coil it, and then it goes back up the inside. So in the top, you end up with these two tubes where you put the chilled water in and out. And so we set a little valve that goes on here, and this temperature probe plugs into the junior panel, and your sampling port is actually shifted from here to here. So this is actually a very handy device if you want to have temperature control in junior, which is pretty much necessary if you're going to use it for, uh, for white wine. So I see that we don't have uh, many questions today. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I hope you learned something. I hope uh, it helped pass the time. And we'll see you again next week. So bye-bye and cheers. <laughs>